thank you very much for all coming. I, I am not an expert on GS1. I am a, a practicing doctor, as you heard. I want to start about a, a case I was involved with just last month. Um, it was a child who was admitted to our accident emergency department who, unusually in paediatrics, had a cardiac arrest. We see quite a lot of respiratory arrests. The child didn't have a heartbeat for 16 minutes, so was being resuscitated was bleeding profusely, it wasn't clear where the bleeding was coming from, had an emergency uh, endoscopy in a &E, had almost his whole circulating blood volume replaced. Uh, heartbeat came back after 16 minutes and, and he survived. And I tell you that story because some of the themes of that I'm going to return to during the course of my talk. But it should emphasize, if nothing else, that, that patient safety is, as Gl Glenn said, all of us who get up to go to work, it's absolutely through us, like, like the writing through a stick of rock. When I was here last time, Glenn mentioned, um, uh, one of the things I, as a clinician, was challenge I was trying to give the GS1 board is that we need clinical data. You've got a lot of data about cost savings, about better procurement, about more efficient throughput. But what will really get the buy-in is if you can provide clinical data. And indeed, when we were, some of us were in Chicago recently, one of the things that I think it's quite hard to impress Americans, as I'm sure you know, but I think one of the things they were impressed was the actual crosstalk in the NHS between all of those people, directors of finance, practicing clinicians, procurement, quality improvement. And I didn't get that sense. A lot of the American presentations were very interesting, but I didn't get the sense of that deep engagement between all the parts of the health service. And I'm delighted that having taken up that challenge, you'll hear, as, as Glenn mentioned, Bod Goddard, who's here, will be talking later about the clinical data he's been um, acquiring through uh, particularly looking at endoscopy and gastroenterology. I'm going to start with a bit of a, a actual, this is a personal story. So I had a, a, an operation on the 27th of March this year. I had major spinal surgery. I was on the operating table for five hours. This is my MRI scan. So those of you who aren't used to looking, this is my spine. Top, bottom, front, belly button, back. That should be a nice, smooth curve. And I've had a condition for, that I've known about for about 30 years called spondylolisthesis, where I have a little fracture in my spine, but it's fairly stable. And in the few months running up to March, it became unstable. And this vertebra here, my L4 vertebra, started to slip forward on L5. And you can see, instead of a nice, smooth contour there, you can see there's a step there. And I was getting unbelievable pain in my right leg and pins and needles such that I couldn't walk more than about for two minutes without stopping. So I had surgery. This is my, my, this is my post-op MRI here. So you can see that now I've got a nice, smooth curve. They've moved one vertebra forward and the other to I've got two screws in here. This is a diagram. Someone pointed out that, uh, oh, did they make a mistake? This is, this is L3, L4, not L4, L5. This is just a diagram that shows more clearly the screws and rods that were put in. But this is my actual post-op MRI scan. So I've got a screw here, a screw there, same, two more on the other side, four screws in total, two rods. It's like a bit of scaffolding. And then this really clever thing. When no, nobody here is squeamish, are they? <laughs> Don't want anybody fainting. When they drill the holes in your vertebra to put the screws in, they salvage the bone chippings. And they pack those chippings into this little titanium cage. And they take the disc out between the vertebra and they put the cage in instead. And it's your own bone. So it's like a bone graft from yourself that then lets those two vertebrae fuse. So I'm delighted that went successfully. I wouldn't be here. Otherwise, I can now walk 40,000 steps in a weekend without pausing. So it's a real tribute to had it done on the NHS, and I'm delighted. But I wanted to show you that because all of the stuff I'm going to talk about really matters to me. When you go into theatre, you're going to have an anaesthetic, you're going to wake up in five hours' time, you really want to know that they put the right screws in the right place, in the right person, product, person, place, yeah? So all of this really, really matters to me. And it really mattered to me on that day, that Monday morning, because I've been aware over the last 15 years, as you'll see from my personal story, that whilst we think, I'm sure we all hope we all think the NHS is great, that like any healthcare system in the world, we get up in the morning to do our best, but we do make mistakes. And unintended errors and untoward consequences of healthcare are one of the top major causes of, of uh, mortality in the UK. 
So the, no, it's not that the NHS isn't safe. There's no first world healthcare system that's absolutely safe. The, the risk in the NHS is broadly comparable to other first world countries like the US, Canada, Australia that have looked at, at, uh, at mistakes. And you'll see we still have about 400 never events a year in the United Kingdom, which the Secretary of State is very concerned about, and I will return to at the very end with my, my clarion call this year, my challenge to GS1 this year. That was my, I, I gave you my challenge last year. So I'm not going to talk about GS1 particularly, a little bit. This is much more a personal journey about patient safety, and GS1 is just one of a range of technologies that can help us as practicing doctors practice more safely and keep our patients safe. I'm going to talk about how I got into this through visiting Shell. I'm going to talk about two patients, Abby Humphreys and Wayne Jowett. I'm going to talk about the time I spent with the National Patient Safety Agency a little bit and a review I did for the MHRA. And then I am going to come back at the very end to never events. So that's the kind of uh, signposting of what I'm going to talk about. So this is, uh, I, in 2003, I did something called the Cabinet Office Top Management Program. And in that program, I was dean of a medical school at the time. You had to pick, if you worked in the public sector, you had to spend two weeks in the private sector and vice versa. And I chose to go to Shell in Scotland because I wanted to visit another high-risk, you know, safety-critical industry and see how they handled things. So when I turned up, I was met by a, a, a Shell driver who picked me up at Aberdeen Airport. And when we got to the Shell building, he, uh, in broad daylight, he reversed the car into this parking space. There was no other car there. And I said, well, you know, why did you do that? And he said, well, we've done some research. All the accidents that happen in Aberdeen happen when people drive in in the morning, work a long day, and reverse out at night in the dark, and they reverse into someone else. So you're not allowed in the Shell car park to drive in in the morning. You have to reverse it. OK, I thought, well, that's, that's fine. Then I went in, and I was given, uh, asked if I want some coffee. had some coffee. Um, immediately, somebody said, if you're going to walk around with that, you have to put a lid on it. Because if you walk around with hot coffee on an oil rig, and you trip and fall, and you scold someone else, we'll have to send a helicopter out, maybe in bad weather, to bring that person back to Aberdeen. And then they said, let's go up to the meeting room. Went up the stairs. I'd taken no more than two steps up these stairs. And somebody put their hand on my arm. And by this stage, I felt like a four-year-old. And said, uh, if you want to go up the steps, you have to hold the banister. Because if you don't get used to that, and you're on an oil rig, and you're going up a ladder or steps, and you fall off, then we've got to come. You're in the sea. We've not only got to get you out, you've put yourself at risk. But the winch man who gets winched down from the helicopter, you and I are putting his life at risk. So I had a really strong impression of, a, of an industry where safety was right, absolutely dead center at the heart of their culture. They had a mantra, which was there's two ways of doing everything. There's the shell way and the wrong way. And that was such a, a powerful credo. And in contrast, when I went back to the <clears throat> hospital where as dean of the medical school I was also a non-exec director. So a big hospital, 1,300 beds, 10,000 staff, lots of emergencies. Hand washing. A simple procedure that Semmelweis discovered 150 years ago in Vienna. We know it saves lives. Our compliance with hand washing in this big hospital seeing lots of emergencies probably on average about 70% for doctors, 85% for nurses. Would Shell accept that kind of practice? In Shell, I'm not saying it needs to be quite so authoritarian, but they were quite clear. If people broke those rules, as, as I unwittingly did, but if their staff did, the first time they were just gently warned, second time verbal warning, third time dismissed. So they took safety really, really seriously, in a way that I didn't see in the, in the NHS. And when I went on then to work for the National Patient Safety Agency, this is another big hospital, not mine, but an equally big hospital, I won't name it, in the north of England, seeing, uh, serving a, a big city, seeing lots of people. They had about 65 different infusion pumps, and this is where they stored the infusion pumps, all higgledy-piggledy, some charged, some not charged, most with no manuals. And after we intervene, this is what it should look like. I think that's what, what that shell culture would expect. And we also 
taught procurement about, do you really need 65 different pumps? Because that means all the staff need to be familiar with 65 different ways of doing things. So a rationalization of the number of infusion pumps, better storage, fully charged. I think that's, that says it all. My first contact with um, something I didn't realize at the time was GS1, but with barcoding actually came through this case here, Abby Humphreys was actually a, a patient of mine. I'm happy to show this because it was all in the public domain in the, in the national media at the time. But in 1997, she was a, a baby who was on the uh, neonatal intensive care unit and recovering and was abducted. And I was her consultant pediatrician at the time. Um, and it was a very big case, but what it eventually led to was the adoption of wristbands. And uh, not long after that, it became clear that just wristbands with handwriting on them, we could do better. And, and a barcoded, unique identifier on a wristband became uh, a, a commonplace thing, and then started to be used piecemeal. Here you can see it on a, a bag of blood for blood transfusion. So the idea of using barcoding, what I didn't realize was to a GS1 standard, was creeping in in, o over a decade ago, this is almost 15 years ago, Abby Humphrey 20 years ago, but not in a, in a comprehensive way. Second case I want to mention to you happened in my hospital, but it was, what, he wasn't a patient of mine. Wayne Zhao was actually 19 years old at the time. He was uh, an adult, he wasn't a child. And he had leukemia, potentially treatable uh, malignancy, which required... Um, chemotherapy. And he was due to, he came in, he was due to be given a drug called vincristine. He was due to be given that intravenously into a vein. And tragically, he was given, a, an, a, for, in certain cancers, we also use what's called intrathecal vincristine. That is vincristine given directly into the spinal cord. That's a, a, a recognized treatment. But that wasn't what Wayne Zhao was due to get. And it's a different dose. And he was given the intravenous vincristine into his spine. And sadly, he, he subsequently died some weeks later. An absolutely tragic case. What's really tragic about it is this is the 23rd time that has happened in the United Kingdom. And probably the 123rd time or 1230 time around the world. It's been described, it's been written up. And it's because you can connect an intravenous connector to a, a spinal needle. Now, Toyota are well aware of this. Japanese car manufacturer, they call this pokayuki. It's the way in which you engineer something so that you cannot make that mistake. They would have engineered it, I'm absolutely sure, that there's no way an unwitting trainee junior doctor could unwittingly connect an intravenous connector to a spinal connector. And lots of things that go into Japanese car manufacture are done in this way so that it's fail-safe. So because of Wayne Jowett, I was, um, uh, not because of Wayne Jowett, Liam Donaldson, the then Chief Medical Officer, set up something called the National Patient Safety Agency. And he invited some people from around the country who had an interest in this nascent subject. Would they, would they be seconded? I was seconded to the National Patient Safety Agency for a day a week for three years. And I'll just show you a couple of the things that I, I was working on then, one of which does relate to barcoding. But for this picture, I'm very grateful to a colleague, Kevin Fong, who's one of my anaesthetic colleagues at University College Hospital. He's sometimes on TV talking about, he's got a big interest in space medicine. And he, he did spend some time at NASA. So this is a, a, a still from a, a film called Monsters, Inc. You may not have seen it, but your children almost certainly will. This is the President of the United States. I'm not going to say it's any particular president. I mean, could be the present president. I don't want to, you know, but... Could be. And there's two large red buttons that look for all the world identical. Now, one of these buttons launches an intercontinental ballistic missile against North Korea. The other button makes a skinny cappuccino. <laughs> now, Poka Yoko, would you, you know, monsters, it's a cartoon, couldn't possibly happen, could it? Couldn't. So here are some drugs from that resuscitation trolley of that child who had no heartbeat for 16 minutes. They're all clear, colorless fluids. They have no smell. They all come in identical packages. They all have little yellow and white labels on them with black writing, all in the same font. They do have barcodes, you'll see, but um, it's a step forward. But 
for me, that's a situation really similar to this. This is you can much more serious than, well, couldn't be more serious than mistaking a skinny cappuccino for an intercontinental ballistic <laughs> missile. But for that child, to give a, a, a child where you intend to give them uh, sodium chloride and you give them injection potassium chloride or lignocaine, that could easily be fatal. So the barcoding creeping in piecemeal, it allows, perhaps helps procurement, helps people buy these vials, but until you link person, product, place, you haven't gone on the whole journey. And while I was at the National Patient Safety Agency, my, my big drive really related to drugs and using electronic prescribing uh, as a safer way of prescribing and administering drugs. It's been around in the United Kingdom in general practice for over 30 years. I went to uh, Washington, the United States, to, it was very common in hospitals there, and yet in most big UK hospitals, electronic prescribing was not available. These two patients were both my patients at the same time. So this was a 16-year-old young woman I'd looked after since she was a baby. She had a rare inborn error of metabolism. She became pregnant, and she had a premature baby who weighed uh, uh, just around a kilo. And so I'm prescribing drugs for both of them at the same time using that cutting-edge technology called a fountain pen and a piece of cardboard. Uh, not 21st century medicine to me. The capacity for getting a 10 or 100-fold error here is immense. Mum weighs 60 kilos, the baby weighs one kilo. We might be using the same drugs in both patients. Uh, a decimal point error, a microgram symbol mistaken for a milligram symbol, these are just all potentially fatal errors. And I wrote a piece in the BMJ uh, after meeting the Secretary of State, really flagging up this fact that there's all of this technology out there. The technology, uh, the example I gave, the technology I used to come here today to book my Heathrow Express and pay for it and, and uh, to have it on my phone is just, at that point, it's coming but wasn't available in the NHS. When I'm on the ward, I generally don't have much more than my iPhone and a stethoscope. That's about it. I need to be able to use that kind of technology to download stuff, for it to be searchable, accessible, guidance, uh, protocols. And the NHS is not there. It's not there yet. It's, it's doing better than it was when I wrote this. But the kind of technology of which GS1 is just one example, I'm trying to show you an example that electronic prescribing is, is it's taking too long to get it to the, to the front line of medicine. In 2010, and I'm coming to the end now of my, my personal journey, there were two big um, scandals in the United Kingdom relating now to implants rather than to drugs. Uh, one was a concern that metal on metal hip replacements were both the head of the, the part put in as the head of the femur and the part put into the pelvis to, to receive it, the ball and socket joint, using both parts as metal. There was a concern that some of this metal was coming off and getting into the circulation and causing harm. And then there was the scandal over the uh, PIP silicon breast implants, where a French manufacturer was using industrial grade silicon rather than health grade silicon. In a sense, second is a criminal activity. Can't avoid people, people using the, the wrong silicon to cut corners and save money. You can't blame the NHS. And metal on metal, well, perhaps there should have been more research or better surveillance, but again, it was, it was unwitting. But what really struck people when this happened was that they could not track and trace who had had a metal-on-metal -metal implant or all of the women who had had the, the PIP manufactured uh, silicon breast implants. So people knew about this. They knew they'd had to take, either take the hip out or take the silicon implant out. But if you can't track the people and bring them in, you can't do it. A, a whole gaping uh, lacuna in our, in our patient safety strategy. And I was asked to do a review for the medicine, or to chair a review for the Medicines Healthcare Regulatory Agency, looking at this. And surprise, surprise, and I had a lot of very expert colleagues advising me, but of course what came out of that was this idea of track and trace with a UDI, a unique device identifier. And we were really, we are really lucky in the United Kingdom because every single one of us, every one of you who is in this room from the United Kingdom, will have been given an NHS number at birth, which we hardly use. My hospital, we all have hospital numbers. But we all have an NHS number. It is a unique identifier. And if we put that and barcode that with uh, barcoding things that we put in, 
then we've got a track and trace solution. We've got a unique device identifier. We've got a unique patient identifier. Put the two together. We know who's had what and when and where. And it's not difficult technology. How many people in this room, hands up, have in a supermarket used a barcode uh, reader to, to do their shopping? Okay. How many people in this room had to go for a half-day course to be taught how to use that? <coughs> I have so much mandatory training. I can, I've got 21 modules to do before Christmas. Fire extinguishers, protecting my back, backlifting, information governance. What if we all, 1.4 million NHS staff, had to go on a half-day course to use a barcode reader? It would never happen. You don't need to. It's completely intuitive. And, and we use it all the time. I use it all the time, certainly in my local supermarket. So this uh, got quite a lot of headlines, the idea of barcoding uh, uh, material that's going to be put into patients. It's a technology that's been around a long time. I hope I've showed you that some of this thinking has been around definitely, since, in my experience, since Abby Humphreys in 1997, probably before that. And, and meetings like this are about trying to share with you that we still need to do more. And we particularly need to do more. There's often comparisons made between the airline industry and health service, which I think in many ways are, are unfair. I won't dwell on that today. But one really startling statistic is that if 99.9% .9 were viewed as good enough in the airline industry, that would be a major plane crash every three days. Um, if we didn't, 99.9% .9 of that uh, labeling, wristband labeling was good enough 12 babies would be given to the wrong parent every day. This is based on a US population. And there'd be 37,000 errors every hour of people taking money out of their cash machine. So I think just that brings home to me that we can't in the NHS, I guess we'd think 99% is pretty good. But actually even 99.9% .9 is just not good enough. So my final slide is my challenge to GS1 and its board and all of you for this year is 99.9% isn't good enough. The NHS sees a million patients every 36 hours. So you could say, oh, well, 400 never events a year. Take the d numerator, take the denominator. 400's not bad when we're seeing a million people every 36 hours. But actually, 400's 400, too many. People having the wrong limb operated on, the wrong side of their face operated on, um, the wrong piece of equipment put in, equipment left in, the wrong drug given and the wrong dose. These are never events that don't need to happen. And my challenge to you would be, is there a way, a lot of 400 really clever people here at the cutting edge of technology. Can you use your um, brains and wherewithal and innovation and entrepreneurship to help practicing doctors like me? We don't get up in the morning to do 400 things wrong a year, but it happens and it's a sort of challenge to you is can you make this better? Thank you very much. <laughs>